Hallelujah. Glory to God. This is a beautiful day in God's neighborhood. You know, rain brings cleansing. It, it feeds the seed. <laughs> Thank you, Master. Hallelujah. Welcome to Sunday Morning Live. Thank you. What times and seasons we are in right now. Everything is preparing. We are being prepared. If you recall me, I think, I don't know if it was Friday night or whatever, but anyways, uh, or Tuesday or Sunday or whatever. Anyway. I shared about a vision that I had about the, uh, hur like a hurricane. And uh, we were in the eye of it and getting ready to come out. Because there's going to be a lot of things that are going to start to escalate in a mighty way. And it's important that we stay in position, stay filled, dressed, and possessed with the anointing. We talked about multidimensional battles that we've been going through and that there are multidimensional battles where people are too focused just in the physical realm or they're too focused just in the soulish realm and how they feel, which is a very dangerous place. I want to tell you that being soulish is just as dangerous as being flesh. In fact, in fact sometimes soulish are more dangerous than the flesh. So in this multidimensional battles, the Spirit brought to me this morning, and I saw where Jesus was baptized. When he got baptized in water and a dove came on him, they said the, a dove, they saw a dove come. I saw that dove turn into a sword. I want you to grab hold of something because it is so vital today that we understand about this battle that we're in, because we were born in a war, amen? And that battle continues, and so many times we get drifted and get caught up and forget about the battle, because we get so caught up emotionally in things of our life and things that are going on and family affairs and all those other temporary things. Losing sight of the eternal thing and why you and I were rescued. Remember, we are called to what? Battle. Our purpose is to destroy Satan's kingdom. And our destiny is to infiltrate in the world system and rescue those who have been taken captive. That is everything to me and you. That's how we should live. That's how we should think. And that's how we should walk. And everything we go, wherever you go, there's going to be an animal. What do I need to battle? The word says, bind the strong man before you enter in. That's a part of battling. So you must start your battle in the morning. You don't wait till you're attacked and try to battle. It's a lot harder if you're wounded to fight. Because you know what happens? Some people are still licking their own wounds and trying to fight, and it just doesn't work. This is a spiritual battle. We are in a spiritual warfare. It means unseen. Would you turn to Hebrews chapter 4? The sword of the Lord. We will hear a cry that will come. Well, people will be crying the sword of the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of what? Disobedience. 
See, everything associated in the kingdom of God, the price is cooperation. If you're not willing to cooperate, there's no victory. I don't care how many times you call on Jesus. He may come and rescue you. But then there's a time when he's going to say, why haven't you learned? Does everybody get it? Why haven't you learned? There's times when there's a quick rescue and then there's a long-term rescue. Why? Because the Word says, when I went astray, I was afflicted. That's called disobedience. People wonder why they get afflicted. Because they go astray. Why? Number one is they don't battle. They don't even read their Bibles. They don't even know how to fight. And God has made it so simple through this booklet. It's called a penetrating prayer booklet. People get these things and put them on their shelves and don't even use it. This is a part of the sword of the Lord, the sword of the Spirit. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is freedom, right? See, the sword is established in the area where God spoke. His words are laws. Every one of his words is a law. And if people don't start fighting, that's how Obama won because nobody was fighting anymore. And, and then 2012 was the start of a new age of darkness. And now there's a recovery from all of this evilness and wickedness, which is still infiltrated and overflowed into our schools and our teachers and everything else. The, the demonic forces are dumbing down humanity. They're making it common for sin. They're making it common for lust. They're making it common for self-destruction to a temple. They're making it a common thing. They're making it common to be rebellious and disobedient to God. Remember the Democratic Party voted God out. People forgot that. And how many believers are still promoting the agenda of the Democratic Party and don't realize that they are cursed? See, if you're not in a battle, you become a what? Casualty. Oh, hallelujah. Verse 12. Let's speak it. For the word of God is living. It's what? It's living. And powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even the division of the soul, the spirit, and the joints and marrow, which is the flesh, means it's multidimensional and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the hearts and there is no creature hidden from his sight but all things are naked and open to the eyes of the Lord to whom we must give account we must give what account in other words nobody escapes what you do here is affecting you home. What you refuse to do here, if you make it home, you'll have to learn at home. Everybody's being trained. Listen, this is not a religious operation, amen? And so many people fall back into that religious because it's been impounded in us about religion, religion. What religion are you? I'm not religion. I'm created brand new. I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm not about a religion. In fact, the word religion means bondage. I'm free because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. There's difference. I'm not an addict. I hate sin. I hate evil. And I despise the arena of the agenda of evil. That means I must fight. See, because people are still waiting on someone else to do it. Oh, someone else will do it. No, you're accountable for what you do. Nobody escapes getting before the throne of God and being accountable. What did you do? See, people search out churches to see what they can get from them. Instead of searching out a church to see what I can bring them. People are takers instead of givers. Until they become a soldier of the Most High and the heart of God Almighty is changed in them. 
and they become a giver, not a taker. We have a dimensional sword. It's called the sword of the Lord. It is a weapon of God. It pierces spirit, soul, body. It discerns the thoughts of a man. So if people don't read the word, how are they going to know? You know what? Those are the individuals that say, I don't sin. What do you mean? I haven't sinned in years. Just step away from them. You don't know what's going to happen. Don't be in their four-foot vicinity. <laughs> in John chapter 1. What do you mean repent? I don't need to repent. I haven't done anything. Where are you going? <laughs> Out of here. Gospel of John. Parents these days have become more friends than parents. They want to entertain their children instead of raise them up. They buy their children. That's what they do these days. It's promoted. It's promoted through radio, TV shows, music. It's all promoted. People don't even realize it especially in schools. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, let's speak it. It says, in the beginning was the what? Now, wait a minute. What? what didn't we just say that the sword is the word? Amen? So, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and, no, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was what? Life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. In verse 14, and the word, the word, the sword became what? Flesh. The sword of God, the sword of the Lord became flesh. Now just think about this. God's weapon became physical for mankind. That was the only way that he can make the exchange to get weapons to his people. He had to become the weapon. Didn't he destroy Satan's kingdom? Amen. Even though it's still going, he's already, he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He destroyed it. It's just not been in fulfillment yet. Everything's falling into place. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory and the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Grace meaning God's plan. And truth is associated with judgment. Because everything will be judged by truth. So we see here that the sword became flesh to make an exchange and arm the Lord's army here. Again, I want you to visualize the area when, Jesus, when the Spirit came upon Jesus, it was a sword that was released. Because he didn't do any battling until the Spirit came. Not only did he empower him, but he empowered him with the sword. Is everybody okay? In Matthew 10. Jesus came to save the world. But he couldn't save the world without arming them. Does everybody get it? Other than that, he had to destroy everything. So he came to arm those willing to become his followers and carry on the ministry. Remember, Jesus, the third of the ministry was casting out devils. A third of the ministry was healing. A third of the ministry was pre uh, preaching. All associated with the sword. And Matthew 10, 34. 
Let's speak it. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a what? A sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Look, at we see this right now. There are arguments in families big time because of political. But it's really not about the political. It's about the agenda. It's causing division. That was the whole purpose of the last, uh, well, eight years of Obama was to bring division because even Satan knows that a house divided cannot stand. And his purpose was to bring division in this country like it never had before. But God sent a rescue. He was on a rescue mission. He said, I, I, I'm not going to let my country, a joint heir of Christ, be destroyed by the witches and demonic forces, by Jezebel and Ahab. It's, it's always been destroying God's kingdom. And he raised up a man, just like he raised up David. Verse 37. And he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross. Now what's his cross? His sword. It's his sword. Remember, Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a what? A sword. And he doesn't use his sword. Cannot follow me. He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. In other words, you can't, you got to deny yourself and pick up your sword to fight so that you can follow. Remember, you can't follow without a fight because there's constant resistance. Always. When you sleep, when you wake, wherever you go, there's going to be constant resistance. Everything to come against the will of God. Listen, we use the sword of the word of the Lord to cut things loose. But the problem is that so many times people take too long to use it. They go physical before they go spiritual. Then they wonder why it takes longer because they've gone physical first. And it says in he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will what? Lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Wow. Jesus came to bring the sword of his words and daily pick up the sword and fight to follow. Remember, the sword is able to pierce all dimensions. It's the only weapon that pierces dimensions. No missile, no bomb, no bullet, no fire can infiltrate every dimension. Only the sword of the Lord infiltrates all dimensions. Ephesians 6. What's the first thing the devil likes to come to steal? Your identity. Ephesians chapter 6. The sword of the Lord, or what we might call the weapon of God. <laughs> In verse 10, let's speak it together. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the trickery or the manipulation or the attacks of the devil. See, again, I want to re reiterate, people still don't put on the full armor of God. They don't even know what it is. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts and wickedness in heavenly places. That's all three dimensions. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. That means fight. Stand, therefore, girding your waist with the what? Truth. 
having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. That means the voice of the stranger. You know, they're shooting at you all the time. You may not see it. This is where people get confused. They think every one of their thoughts is theirs. Never realizing who told them that. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of, the, of God. In other words, it is the sword of the Lord. You know, the word says, and where the Spirit is, there's freedom. And when someone turns to the Lord, the veils come off. Why? Because they're cut off. Is everybody okay? Verse 18, and praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit which is tongues, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and even for me that utterance may give unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am a what? Ambassador in change, that it may that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. How many of y'all know we're ambassadors? We are soldiers. We're offsprings of the anointed one, joint heirs of Christ. The sword of the spirit is the sword of the word. It must be backed by the anointing. Amen. It doesn't become the sword of the Spirit or the, or the sword of the Lord until it's backed by the anointing. Jesus was the Word. Amen? He was the sword. When the anointing came on Him, He was the sword of the Lord. Does everybody get it? Psalm 149. Psalm 149. Hallelujah. And verse 5. Psalm 149, verse 5. Let's speak it. Let the saints be joyful in glory. That's glory realm. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Praise God, you're not in bed anymore. You can sing louder. Let the high praises of God be where? In their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Now, I want you to look at something because in the Old Testament, the high praises of God were in their mouth so that the anointing would come so they can use the sword because they didn't have the sword of the Spirit. They had to use a physical sword. Does everybody get it? But there's been an exchange made. Now the high praises of God are in our mouth, and so is the sword of the Lord. And what's it used for? To execute vengeance on the nations, punishments on peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with the fetters of iron. In other words, this is against wickedness. And to execute on them the what? The written judgment. The written judgment of God. This honor he have all his saints. That's an honor. When you and I were baptized in the Holy Spirit, a sword came. We were sealed as a warrior. Third dimensional warriors. A sword came from heaven. It was exchanged so that you and I could battle and fight and access every dimension all three dimensions. But it does no good if it's just sitting on the shelf collecting dust. That's where God says, my people are destroyed for ignorance. Lack of knowledge. Lack of understanding of this. Hallelujah. It is the sword of judgment also. Amen. Everyone say, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. With the sword of the Lord. Proverbs 18.
Remember, Jesus' ministry was only about three years, three and a half years. What he did in that short period of time was phenomenal. It's still going. But what did he handed? He handed the sword down. He handed the sword down. So let me ask you this. What would the enemy not want you to have? The sword. That's why there are places where there's mixed anointings or mixed words where people are not preaching the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because the enemy has infiltrated and turned the word of God. Believing that certain things were only done for the apostles. Does everybody understand? Believe me, I've been at places where they don't believe in the baptism. They don't believe in tongues. They don't cast out devils. and what, They don't believe in any of that. Why? Because the enemy's infiltrated and prevented and blocked the individuals from getting the sword. So they become religious, not free. Listen, I, I was brought up in church. I was an altar boy. I drank a lot of their wine. Used to take the, anyway, never mind. <laughs> I won't go there. <laughs> But I never knew about, you know, people can talk about something but never bring it in. You know what I'm saying? Oh, they talk. They might, um, uh, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You do? What happened? Nothing. You know, there was no relationship by the Spirit. No release of a sword. No power. Just religion. Here, go learn. Go do it on yourself. What's the matter with you? Why don't you stop doing what you're doing? I ain't got no power. But I didn't know I didn't have any power. I didn't know there was any power available. People were still relying on someone else to do it for them. When Jesus came to bring me and you a sword, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is the sword of the Lord. That's what lacks. I'll never forget one day, my neighbor, when we just moved into our house, and the, their faucet was, the outside spigot was running, and I went over there, and I said, man, look at, you're, you're leaking water out of here. It's cracked. And uh, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll fix it if you want. You know, because there was a woman that was living there, and she had two or three kids, and apparently her husband had committed suicide. And so I started, so they came out. I, I was fixing it, and, and we started talking, and. And uh, I started sharing my testimony about my visitation with the Lord and getting baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. She's like, what? That's not, that's not for today. I said, uh, well, uh, are you, do you go to fellowship? Yeah. And she said she was Baptist. I didn't know anything about that stuff. I didn't know you, I, I, believe me, until I got baptized and had visitation with the Lord, I didn't even know what a Christian was. So I didn't know anything. You're a Baptist. Okay, what's that, you know? Then I began to see all over the country where it said the first Baptist church. I always wanted to know which one was really first. I, I didn't understand that. I think, how come they said they're first and they're first? And there's about 40 more on the other side of this, you know. They're all first. But I never knew which one was first. And I realized that knowing the word without the presence of God has no effect. And so, and so she brought her kids out. And, and they're all standing around. She's going, he's speaking about another baptism. You didn't know about another baptism? Yeah, we got baptized in water. I said, but you never got baptized in the Holy Spirit. She said, I don't know anything about it. I thought, wow. Anyways, we had a little training session, and I went about my way. Verse 21. Hallelujah. We end up getting her house anyways. <laughs> She didn't know that she was in foreclosure and all kinds of stuff. And so she said, would you like my house? I said, 
Praise God. So we took over the house. <laughs> That's where the discipleship house is at. Hallelujah. Verse 21. Let's get to it. Death and life are in the power of the what? The tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruits. Wow. Death and life. Power means breath, words. And the tongue. Revelation chapter 1. Verse 12. Now let's start at verse 10. Everybody there? I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice of, as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Samaria, Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardius, Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. Having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, girded about the chest with a golden band, his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. That's Jesus, you know. He don't look like Jesus when he was here. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth when a what? Sharp, two-edged sword. The one that he now transferred to me and you. And his countenance was like a man, like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell on at his feet as dead. But he laid his hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Because he is the sword of God who went to hell and took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He is the sharp two-edged sword. When Jesus came, he came as the sword of the Lord. Amen? And made the exchange that you and I could have the sword of the Lord. In Romans chapter 13. What is the sword? It's, it, and, and, and it's about... Righteousness and justice. The sword is, a, is, a, is associated with righteousness and justice because it carries the eternal truth. Romans 13. In verse 1. Is everybody okay? Oh, happy days. Romans 13, verse 1, let's speak it. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resist the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For the rules are not a terror to do good works, but to what? So they're not a terror to good works, but they're a terror to evil works. The problem is when you have an evil government in there, it isn't working that way. Does everybody get it? Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Well, these days, you know, in the last whatever, you do, you speak about Jesus, which is good, you're going to be persecuted. So he's talking about godly individuals that are in authority. Does everybody understand that? He says, these are God's ministers to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in what? In vain. 
for he is God's minister. If you're a minister of God, you carry the sword of the Lord. If you're born again and spirit-filled, cooperating with the will of God, you are a servant of the Most High God, and you bear the sword of the Lord. He, if he, he's God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices what? Evil. This is your right as a birthright. Is everybody okay? Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. I always look at those as paying tithes, because there's taxes in the government. Not only physically, physical government, but the eternal government. Those taxes are called tithes. Does everybody understand that? What does it support? It supports the household to get Bibles out, to go into jails, to feed and clothe people. In fact, the word says that you will receive a curse if you're not a tither. Those are takers, not givers. Psalm 107. The sword of the Lord. Psalm 107, verse 19. Yeah, we'll start at 17. Fools. That's what he says. Verse 17 says what? Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Hello. <laughs> when I went astray, I was what? Afflicted. Their soul abhorred all manner of food. They drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and did what? Healed, his, healed them. What is the word? It is the sword. It pierces what? The joints and the marrows, the bones. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with what? Rejoicing. He sent his sword. He sent his word. It's a sword of healing also. Psalm 94. It's not only known as the sword of judgment, but it's also known as the sword of vengeance. Verse 1, let's speak it. Psalm 94. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongs, O God, to whom vengeance belongs, shine forth. Rise up, O God, judge, the o judge of the what? Of the earth. Render punishment to the proud. Lord, how long will the wicked, how long will the wicked triumph? They utter speech and speak insolent things. All the workers of iniquity boast in themselves. They break in pieces your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. What's his heritage? Not only are we, but how about Jerusalem? Amen. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Yet they say, the Lord does not see. See, murdering the fatherless is an unborn child. Yet they say, the Lord does not see, nor does the God of Jacob understand. Understand, you senseless among the people, and you fools. When will you be wise? He who planted the ear, shall he not hear? He who formed the eye, shall he not see? He who instructs the nation, shall he not correct? He who teaches man knowledge, the Lord knows the thoughts of man, that they are what? That they are what? Futile. Blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law, which is your word. 
that you may give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit is dug for who? The wicked. For the Lord will not cast off his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance. But judgment will return to righteousness, and all the upright in heart will follow. The sword of judgment, the sword of vengeance, be released through the land to execute justice and righteousness, what you and I are seeing right now. Isaiah 66. In verse 12. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I extend peace to her like a river. He's talking about Jerusalem. And the glory of the Gentiles like the flowing stream. Then you shall feed on her sides. Shall you be carried and be dandled in her knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. As you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. When you see this, your heart shall rejoice and your bones shall flourish like grass. The hand of the Lord shall be known to his servants and his indignation to his enemies. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind and rent to render his anger with fury and he will rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword, the Lord will judge all flesh. And the slain of the Lord shall be many. Shall be what? Many. Those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves, who go to the gardens after an idol in the midst, eating swine's flesh and abomination of their mouths, shall be consumed together, says the Lord. For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall be that I will gather all nations in tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them, and those among them to, who escape I will send to the nations, to Tarshish and Pool and Lud, who draw the bow and Tabal and Javan, to the coastlines of far off who have not heard my fame nor seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. The sword of the Lord will slay many. It will expose many. Remember, we are in the second whirlwind, and the first whirlwind is still going. The first whirlwind is tearing back, exposing wickedness. The second whirlwind is bringing strategies and judgments. It's bringing conviction. It's bringing provision. We are in both whirlwinds are still going, and they will begin to increase stronger and stronger and stronger until you and I are taken out in the third whirlwind. Go to Ezekiel 3. Ezekiel chapter 3. And then one more scripture, or two more scriptures. Oh, hallelujah. Starting at verse 1. Ezekiel 3, verse 1. Let's speak it. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this what? Scroll. Is it, what's a scroll represent? God's word. Because what you speak, you eat. What you eat, you become. Amen. He says, look it, eat this scroll and then do what? Go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat the scroll. And he said to me, son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with the scroll that I give you. So I ate and it was in my mouth like honey and sweetness. See, the word should be sweet to you. Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. For they are, are not sent to a, you, for you are not sent to a people of unfamiliar speech and hard language, but to those of the house of Israel. Not to many people of unfamiliar speech and hard language, whose words you cannot understand. Surely, had I sent you to them, they shall have listened to you. But the house of Israel will not listen to you because they are not listening to me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and what? 
hard hardened. Behold, I have made your face strong against their faces and their head and their foreheads strong against their foreheads, like a mandant stone, harder than flint. I have made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house. However, he said to me, moreover, Son of man, receive into your heart all my words that I speak to you. Hear with your ears, and go, get the captives to the children of your people. And speak to them and tell them, thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or whether they refuse. Then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me a great thunderous voice. Blessed is the glory of the Lord from his place. And I also heard the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another, and the noise of the wheels beside them, and great thunderous noise. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Then I came to the captives at Tel Abah, and dwelt, who dwelt by the river Shabar. And I sat where they sat and remained there, astonished among, the seven, among them seven days. Now it came to pass at the end of the seven days that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word of my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. So does that mean we need to warn people? Amen, that's what we're doing. Yet if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Again, when a righteous man, now what's a righteous man? It's when someone's been saved, right? Turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, I lay a stumbling block before him. He shall die. Because you did not give him warning, he shall die in his sin. And his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be what? Remember, so when someone breaks covenant with the Lord, all of their savings in heaven are wiped out. But they get an opportunity to start over. But his blood I will require on their hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he took warning. Also, you have delivered your soul. Then the hand of the Lord was upon me there, and he said, Arise, go out into the plain, and there I shall talk with you. So again, he said, Eat the words of God, speak the words, so it becomes a sword. It is the sword of justice and righteousness, vindication and healing. It is the sword of truth. It also is the sword of blessing. Psalm 24. <clears throat> Psalm 24. Psalm 24. Start at verse 1. Let's speak it together. The earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has what? Clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? He is the what? Lord of hosts, meaning the Lord of the army. He is the king of glory. The Lord of hosts You'll find that many times 
Even David fought with the sword of the Lord. Amen. Remember he, when he fought Goliath, he said, I don't come in anything else but in the name of the Lord. But he called the Lord of hosts. See, in the Old Testament, they really acknowledged the Lord as the Lord of hosts. You'll see that all over. It's always about the Lord of hosts. In other words, the Lord of the army. Because if you really look at the Old Testament, man, they, their, their whole life was nothing but a fight. It was a battle over lands. It was a battle against evil. It was a battle against giants. It was a battle over altars, sacrifices. It was constant. And then there was a time of rest. There was a time of peace, but then it would start right up again. And he was known as the Lord of the hosts. They waited for him for direction of battle. Moses waited for him. David waited for him. Joshua waited for him. And then he put kings in. And everything was associated with the spirit of the Lord so that they would know direction. Because God was with them. So they would get dressed and filled with the spirit of God, but... They said they would come in the name of the Lord of the hosts. But their sword was a physical sword. But the battle was also not only physically, but spiritually influenced by God Almighty. Because when they praised and worshipped, he, he brought confusion in their camps. In fact, the praise and worship team would go out before the military. You don't see that today. You see a praise and worship team going out before an aircraft carrier? It ain't happening. <laughs> now there might be a praise and worship team on the aircraft carrier. Hallelujah. <laughs> Luke 4. Hallelujah. Get ready. Examine yourself, whether you're in the sword of the flesh, the soul. Or the sword of the Spirit of the Lord. Or that you are armed and dangerous. Or you're a wimp. It's real simple. You're either a fighter or a runner. <laughs> Too many runners. Luke 4.18. Let's all speak this together. We're going to decree this in Jesus' name. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. So what came upon you? What came upon you? The sword. The sword of the Lord is upon me. Because he's what? Anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of the sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. We are now the sword of the Lord. That's a part of your identity. Amen? Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. We ask that you continue to revive us, remind us, and quicken us of who we are in you, who you are in us, and the sword and the price that you paid because you became the sword. Thank you, Father, for sending your sword that we may be victorious in all areas of life. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.